one, by the way. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Uh, greetings. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the second session in our Critical Perspectives for Teaching and Learning series. Um, I am Brian McGowan. I'm an Associate Director in the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. Um, I just want to send greetings and welcome to each of you on this day. Um, and we have an amazing speaker. We have Dr. Santiago Toledo, who is here today, who um, has been in this Pogo space for quite some time, um, and we are in for a treat today. And in the interest of time, I'm actually going to just allow Santiago to come in and um, please give a warm, warm welcome. Um, and actually, before I do that, the Critical Perspectives on Teaching and Learning series, let me give a broad stroke there. Um, this is a series that we started here about four years ago, and we really wanted faculty to be in a space to think critically about their teaching, very broad charge. And so again, the goal is to come to these sessions and leave with something tangible that you can actually bring into your classroom and incorporate into your practices. And so that's why we wanted to create this series. And throughout this time, we've had external speakers, we've had our inclusive pedagogy fellows to come in and to offer content and their expertise in this way. And so we had an initial session um, last week with our very own Dr. Sherry Watkins, who's here on this call. Today, we have Dr. Santiago Toledo. And then coming up, we also have Dr. Tanya Ajo's session around increasing accessibility as well. And so please, um, as Lindsay put in the link, look at our sessions and stay tuned. But we are in for a treat today. And so with that being said, I am going to be quiet and turn it over to my dear colleague, Dr. Santiago Toledo. Please, let's give a warm welcome via chat or also here in hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, Brian, for that introduction. Thanks for having me here and for the opportunity to have a chance to be here with you all and, and share some of the ideas and, and things that I've been trying in my classroom for a little bit. So I'm really excited to be here um, and uh, let's get started. So um, Lindsay has been posting a link to a set of resources uh, that we're going to be using today. So please have the two documents that are listed on this slideshow ready before we get started so that you're kind of ready to go. Let's see. There we go. So um, I'm Santiago Toledo. I'm an associate professor of chemistry here in the College of Arts and Sciences in the Department of Chemistry. Um, I started here at American last year in fall of 2022. But I've taught at three different institutions when I started my academic career back in 2009. And I started using POGO um, around 2015. So it's been actually eight years since I've introduced this pedagogy into my classroom. I've used it in classes from 100 level all the way to 400 level. So I've used it all around. And I'm, I'm a committed practitioner for the POGO, for the POGO uh, pedagogy. Um, I started using POGO because... Um, in the first early years of my teaching, a lot of people were really kind at sharing with me a bunch of slideshows, right? So there was just a lot of information, like here's a huge amount of slideshows that you can present about general chemistry, figure out what you want and what you want to put in there. And I started to fine tune those slideshows into something that seemed reasonable to me and that fit my personality. It took like, you know, two to three years of iterations of classes to kind of have something nice together. But even though I had something nice and I was able to give a decent presentation, I wasn't seeing necessarily the outcomes that I was hoping for in my students. That that structure of passive learning for my students was just kind of receiving content from me wasn't necessarily working for what I wanted to do. So at the time, there were some publications that came around that sort of were militant in the sense that they were calling for us to become a little bit more connected with the idea of active learning and active learning pedagogies. So I started searching for structures to do this and things that I could do in my classroom to modify the way that I was doing things so that I can involve my students into the learning process. And in 2015, when I switched institutions to my second institution, I met a colleague that actually was using Pogol and introduced me to the Pogol project. We'll talk about that a little bit more broadly. So this national group of people and practitioners, and that's when I got hooked. And I think the, the thing that was really transformational for me when I started using Pogol was that as I was doing this Pogol activities and working through the content and the material, I was learning new things about a class that I had taught now, what, eight times. And, you know, I had, what, 15, 20 years of chemistry experience, and I was still learning something new. So I thought there was something to the 
pedagogy or the activities if there was some information that I was still teaching me new content. So that was really exciting. Ever since then, I've become a trained facilitator for the Pogo, uh, Pro Pogo project where I run workshops similar to this one uh, to help people sort of thinking about incorporating things like this in their classroom. So that's sort of the general introduction to this and we'll get started right away. So today we're gonna be working in, um, in Teams. So um, hopefully at the end of the session, uh, you'll be able to talk a little bit about what a Pogo classroom looks like. Hopefully also talk about the desirable outcomes for a student within a Pogo classroom. And then if this is something that is interest to you, hopefully become inspired to continue seeking more professional development to try to figure out more about the opportunities associated with the project. So like I said, we're gonna be working in teams. So this is just a couple of like few reminders of the ways that we're gonna be working with. So maybe potentially if you have a second screen, you can have the slide deck next to your Zoom window so you can have that information available to you. Always, if you want, raise your hand function to let me know that I'm actually uh, here to sort of answer any questions. Give me feedback if you need to over the chat or doing reactions. I'm gonna try to monitor that as well as Lindsay's gonna give me a hand, I think, with that too. And if you need to be away, just turn off your video. Otherwise, if you're able and you're feeling comfortable, please turn your video on. Additionally, there's a link to a document here that is also in the resource uh, doc resource folder that is the parking lot. It's just an Excel document for you to sort of dump questions that might come up as you're processing information throughout our conversations. So if anything comes up, just kind of use the parking lot as a place to deposit things. And then at the end of the whole conversation, we'll come back to that. And then we'll be able to hopefully address some of those questions that you have. We're going to be in breakout rooms, so you're going to be working with a team of three or four people. So the instructions will be on the slide deck, right? So I won't be reading those instructions. They'll be there for you. And there's going to be time associated with some, some of this task. So you want to be very much on task when we're doing this. Uh, ask for help button for me to come in and come, come and help you. So if there's anything that you're confused about, I'll just jump in into your room. I'll be rotating rooms. So when I come in, I know that it's kind of freaky when somebody just jumps in, but kind of ignore me. You continue with doing your work. I'm just there to sort of listen in as well as potentially answer questions if there's necess necessity for anything. So potentially somebody that is working within your team can share their screen and then maybe uh, they can see, everybody can then use the resources together. So with that, we're gonna get started with our first breakout room activity. So let's see, in terms of number of people, what are we looking at right now? I'm trying to figure out how many total participants do we have, Lindsay? 14 participants. How many would you like in each room? And that's without you and me? Without us, yes. So ideally, we'll three three at the least, uh, and then four ideally. So four, three, twelve. We'll do four, three. What is that? Three, six, nine, and four. For breakout rooms. Yeah, that would be perfect. So you have the first activity we're going to be working on is called the exploring roles used in Pogo teams. So make sure that you have that handout handy or at least pulled up on your PDF, and does that from that handout is what you're going to perform tasks one and tasks two and each of those tasks has a particular amount of time so now i'm going to let you go ahead and do that unless there are any questions before we go into breakout rooms feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question okay lindsay i think send us off into those breakout yeah, rooms. santiago i do have a question yes go ahead so when I this is Brian Daves. Um, Hi Brian. When I opened up in oh never mind I never mind I was having a problem with my screen never mind. So which is the which is the file that we should be opening first? Um, exploring roles used in Pogo teams. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna go into our groups. And just if everyone could remember which group they're in too, I will we'll go back into these same groups, but I will make a note of where everybody is. Thank you, Lindsay. Mm Lindsay, ideally in team in group one, we have five people. I guess Anna's not there yet. Um, we want to keep it at four at most. But we're good now. If Anna doesn't join, then that's great. 
thank you. Okay, I can see now how I can get in there. So 13 minutes. Lindsay, I can't hear you. Anna just messaged. She's she's multitasking um, and can't join the group. So, but that's that's, that's fine. That's still perfect. Thank you. I'm just gonna start rotating through the groups just to make sure everything's okay. Sure, I'll stay here. Oh, one second. A quick question. Is there a way um, we can get screen sharing within the rooms? Yes. Give me one sec. All right. Thank you. Hi, Anna, by the way. Where are you? Screen share options. Hey, Brian. Sorry, I'm not on camera. I'm not in the group. I'm multitasking. Oh, I'm oh you're curious and interested. Totally understandable. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Okay, Brian, that should work. Let me know.
the cluster mess in there. That's coming up for a break. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. They're kind of going through, they have a lot of different things on their screen. So that's the challenging sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when I stopped sharing my slides, when I had to go into the breakout room, it didn't share with them. So they couldn't see anything else, but that's okay because they should individually be sharing. Okay, cool. And I'm not getting um, any. Amazing. You just let me know when you want me to bring them back. Yeah, I have a timer um, and we are about four and a half minutes out from the time. I think that I will let you know, but it'll be soon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Nuria. Hi, Nuria. We're we're in a breakout room activity right now, but if you'll just hang out with us. Um, um, yeah, it'll be another couple of minutes and that's it. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, no oh, problem. gosh. I'm just so sorry. I've been, you know, I'm, I was just <laughs> trying to get some of these because I really want to listen to Santiago, but it's been one of those days. So no problem. Thank, you. Are you here? thank you for coming. I'll just be here for a while. I really wanted to see what was going on. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Two more minutes and then they'll come out and then welcome back everybody. I think we have almost everybody coming in here yet. And don't forget to remember which room you were in it's because that's the same team that we're going to go back in in a little bit, as well as if you haven't yet changed your name, you're going to keep your name, but then you're going to add the role that you were playing within your team. So make sure that you do that adjustment before we move on to the next activity. Okay, so everybody should be here with me now, correct? I think everybody's back. So... um. Let's open it up for just a couple of minutes for general questions about this idea of roles that you were introduced to. Um, so something that came up during our group is kind of like accurately finding a distinction between being a manager and being a reflector because it kind of both seems like they both have like um, some kind of responsibility for like pacing and like exploring the ideas, but we were curious about kind of your perspective on like how they how they differ. Yeah, thank you. And I think that super the reflectors are really important role. And in and, and you're right, there's actually a lot of overlap. I try to tell my students to try to really separate them by having the reflector focus on the process of what's going on within the team. So like how well executed is the team activity happening? What are the individual people doing? Are the people doing their jobs? So ideally the reflector knows what each of the roles is about. And then they're also thinking about how each of those people in the team are actually performing the role that they're supposed to be doing. So I try to keep them a little bit more focused on the meta analysis rather than the managing kind of moving along kind of tasks. But you're right that they can kind of play a little bit of that, of that role as well. Anything else generally about roles? We can come back, we'll come back to questions at the end, but just kind of anything else that came up about the roles activity.
Okay. So hearing nothing for right now, let's go to the next slide. So we're going to go into another breakout room, which is kind of trying to be the idea of experiencing an actual Pogo classroom experience. So I know that not everybody in this room is actually in the STEM fields. And I also know that I, I don't think except for maybe one or two people in here potentially have experience with chemistry. So the goal here with this activity is not to get too bogged down with the content, okay? Your goal is not to be, we really are academics and people in academia tend to be really crazy about, we're gonna get the right answer. So it's not about that. It's about you going through the flow of the activity and doing the best that you can with the resources that you have available, okay? So the focus here is more the process that you're going through and how is your team actually interacting? So reflectors, this is your time to observe. How is your manager doing? You know, what's going on? Is everybody participating? Are we actually making sure that the space is inclusive? All of those things happening. Okay, so I'm going to send you into breakout rooms, but what you're going to do now is you're going to focus on the document that's called um, Atoms, Molecules, Particles, Oh My. Atoms, Molecules, Particles, Oh My. So this is an actual activity, a Pogol activity. You're going to go through all of the questions and then each team member writes the answers on their own activity. The recorder needs to be ready. Uh, uh, to write down answers for questions 8C and question 11. And uh, make sure that you're ready to report on that question on question 8C on the report out document. So there will be a report out document where you can just write your answer for that particular question, question 8C, not 11, just question 8C. Okay, so are there any questions before we jump into the breakout rooms one more time? Just to clarify, there's going to be two tasks associated with this activity. And the first one is 12 minutes long. The second one is eight minutes long, as in a, is a processing activity about what do you think students gain from this particular type of interaction. So it's a total of 20 minutes that we're going to be in the breakout room. Make sure that you're separating your time accordingly. Okay. So Lindsay, please help me deploy the breakout rooms again and go back into your same spaces. And it looks like it's going to assign you to the same space, everyone. And we have to put Nuria into a team. Anybody that has three people would be the best. Or there was somebody I think that had two, I think. Um, I added her to room one where there were only two people. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Brian, Brian, give me some important feedback that there's a lot of moving pieces here, and I, I, I apologize for that. There's we're kind of getting the hang of it. So you guys are doing a great job and thanks for playing along. Uh, so uh, in my screen, what you can see now is the report out document that ideally all teams should have filled out. That's okay if you didn't get a chance to do that, if your team didn't do that. But this is sort of an example of what you would do with your class. You would have a common document where the students, the report, the re recorder of the student team will actually record down the answer for a key question that you want to highlight. And then you can discuss similarities, differences between the answers that the students are putting together. So I wanted to, um, um, we'll come back to this document in a little bit, but I wanted to go with you. Let's see. Let's see. So let's just kind of uh, uh, sort of talk a little bit about the activity. So if, you, if your um, ambassadors or reporters could just sort of share some thoughts that came out from your teams as you went through the activity, just anything that you'd like to share with everybody. Just kind of general ideas right now. So do you want us to do it in order of group or how do you want us to do this? Uh, anybody wants to get started, that's fine. There's not that many of us. Okay, so I can start if you like. I was in group two uh -huh. uh, with Mary Catherine and Sherry, who are a joy to work with. We wanted to keep having tasks because we loved working together. Uh -huh. um, and we found that uh, this this uh, method shows the important, really sh highlights the importance of working and uh, collaborating together and creates a structure for co-constructing knowledge and for the formation of study groups. Uh, we found the applied component helps students be socialized as scientists and social scientists. 
and that it's applicable to any discipline. The three of us were from three different disciplines, very different disciplines that we could apply it to any of our fields. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another team? I was in group one and we answered this question uh, by saying it gives students confidence in themselves to use logic and deductive reasoning to arrive at answers they didn't previously know. And it also would reduce anxiety of not knowing the subject matter. Mm -hmm. That That's an excellent point. I think um, one of the key things here is that ideally you're coming in with the model is your anchor point for everything, where the model is what anchors the knowledge that you're developing and is trying to assume very little previous knowledge, although that's not real true. That's not true, right? Our students always come in with some experiences and knowledge, but it gives them the opportunity to say, this is not as intimidating because everybody has access to building the knowledge from the model itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other thoughts from other teams? I think... Um... Most of what we said has already been said, but I think one thing that we noticed too was, um, I think it was question five, like, like as we're going through the question sequence, sometimes they're asking the harder questions first and then scaffolding back, which was really interesting. So kind of um, like giving students a challenge to think through. And then once they've thought through that challenge, um, revealing the answer almost so that is really helpful for learning and retention when you've had to struggle with something and then um, the answer is revealed. Well, that's an interesting perspective. We're going to talk a little bit about how the activities are put together, but that that's great. Great insight. Thank you. Anything else regarding that other than content knowledge? What do, what do you think students could gain from this type of learning environment? Anything anybody else would like to share that's not necessarily just the reporters? I mean, it sounds like, you know, having students maybe focus on like one particular role, like kind of make sure that like, first of all, like all those roles are like being covered to some extent, like, you know, for this group project, but also, you know, just gives them like some practice with like the interpersonal, like, you know, skills, like the soft skills that they would probably need in like an interview setting or, you know, in a job setting. Yeah, Chris, thank you. That's a great segue to where we're going next. And it, it's exactly right. That's the the point of all of that. Um, there's often the question of like, so what happens with the roles? How often do you replace them? I let my students work on the same role, two classes, two class periods, and then we rotate again. So throughout the semester, everybody gets a chance to exercise a role and practices on all of those different roles throughout the semester. But um, so I'm, I'm going to move on. So right now there's a there's a part of the presentation where it's going to be a little bit more me talking, just a few more slides. But as thoughts came up and ideas are kind of processing right now, you're processing ideas, have the parking lot document with you. The parking lot document is, is located in the folder, the share folder, and see if you can be typing in insights or questions that you have, anything that's coming to mind, sort of processing as we go along, okay? So let's go to the next slide. So what is POGO? POGO stands for Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. And as the name indicates, it has these two components, the process oriented and then the guided inquiry learning. The process oriented is exactly um, what was described uh, by Chris a second ago, right? Is this idea that we have an emphasis on developing key process skills that the students need in addition to content, right? So the goal here is to use the content as a vehicle to also develop other really important skills. And of course, you've you've all seen sort of, and we all can kind of go through, um, we've all seen sort of the surveys that come out about what are kind of our essential skills that our students need. And oftentimes those always go beyond the technical skills, which are always essential, but there's also a lot of different things that we want our students to develop. And the question is like, and all of us ask this question, with the amount of content we have to cover, how do we get a chance to do these other things, the soft skills that they actually need as well, right? And, and the idea here is that through the use of uh, active roles and collaborative environments and an environment in which the facilitator, the professor is a facilitator and not necessarily the only person that has every, every piece of knowledge, the students are hoping to develop some of these uh, technical, uh, some of these additional skills that we want them to develop. In the POGO project, Specifically, these are the key process skills that the, the uh, POGOL activities are in, interested in developing. Things that are essential like assessment and self-assessment. As you saw, potentially some of the questions ask the students to sort of check their work or to check what went well and what didn't go well. 
management, obviously working in teams, communicating both uh, in, in written form because everybody's expected to write down their answers, as well as hopefully communicating to the broader classroom. So um, the Pogo project has a specific side of the project that is dedicated to actually creating rubrics that are specific to uh, uh, potentially give feedback to students while they're doing the process skills. So for all of these process skills right here, you actually can find individual rubrics that you can use in your classroom. And I recommend that for faculty using this, you can focus on one particular skill. Let's say this semester, you wanna make sure that, uh, I don't know, management is being developed and you basically tell your students that you're gonna be giving them feedback on management, for example. From the side of the guided inquiry, this comes from uh, the idea of constructivism, which is that people learn by building knowledge themselves based on their prior experiences and prior knowledge, right? But the idea is that every unique learner is ultimately coming up with a conceptual idea of what the concept is about, right? So I want my students to internalize that knowledge. Ultimately, when they can use it and put it into practice, first, it has to go through them internalizing that. And it starts with Pogo at the idea of building the content knowledge themselves. So as you went through the activity, hopefully you noticed that you were basically doing some invention of concepts, right? Definitions that oftentimes we give to students in class by saying, well, an atom is, and then we just list what the definition is. In the activities, you do the opposite. You don't give them the definition, but you allow them to build that definition and to build that, that understanding as they go through the activity using a specific model. As somebody was mentioning, the activities are actually very intentionally designed. And these are not worksheets. These are not practice problems for a particular concept. But instead, as you notice, hopefully, there's sort of a cycle called something called the learning cycle, where ideally, uh, if a model is done correctly, if an activity is done correctly, you start with questions that are called exploration questions, where the students are referring to the model to sort of pick information out of a model to start establishing the, the framework, basically, for them to do something followed by concept invention questions where they actually come up with a definition themselves. And then finally, at the end of the activity, you often have one or two application questions, which is what we're more uh, often comfortable with in classes. Like as faculty, we tend to take them into the application mode or those are homework questions, et cetera. But the activity sort of to go through the cycle. And within an activity, you often can see one or two or sometimes even three different learning cycles that could actually be the case for an activity. Um, so like I was defining each of those, uh, we have exploration questions, concept invention questions, and then application questions. And, and it should have that feel, the activity should have that feel as you go through it. So what, um, what are the key pillars for a Pogo classroom? So the key pillars here are teamwork and specifically the idea of codependent teams where everybody's working with a particular role and that role is being emphasized by the facilitator and the students are hopefully playing out that role and using that role to work effectively in teams, allowing everybody an opportunity to develop some skills that they might not be comfortable with sometimes, right? So giving them a chance to do something um, that maybe they need to exercise a little bit more. Reflecting is super important. The reflector in my classes writes a, a, a sort of a report back to the team in terms of how things went. They describe with constructive feedback. So we, I train them in constructive feedback for their teammates in the things that they hope that the team can do better or change or do or, or, or do different next time. The other key aspect is facilitation and hopefully the students begin to recognize the instructor as a facilitator rather than a, a constant source of knowledge. So I'm there to sort of guide their process of understanding and constructing to make sure that I'm clarifying and cleaning up ideas whenever they necessary and potentially introduce it and kind of give some motivation and um, and sort of like a why do we care kind of thing starting starting a class. And then finally, the learning cycle activities being designed very uh, adequately. They cannot be just any activity. So what Pogo is not, and this is something that you'll find on the internet a lot, is that Pogo is not just sort of a worksheet or homework or work that you can give on the side or, or you know, fill in the blank kind of things. The Pogo activities are actually um, go through a peer review process, which is called the Pogo Activity Clearinghouse which is a bunch of practitioners that have designed and written activities in the past, and they make sure that the Pogo activities meet a criteria that is sufficient to sort of qualify as such activity. So you can get activities from them. There's published activities that are out there, but there's also a lot of activities on the internet that I would just kind of sort of caution you as you go through it um, in terms of whether it's useful to call it Pogo or, or necessarily use it in that context. The Pogo project, which is something I've been mentioning, I just wanted to bring up what that is. So this is a non-for-profit organization that started in 2003. 
funded initially by the NSF and now through a lot of private funds and some grant money as well. It's basically thousands and thousands of practitioners across the country, and it doesn't include only people in higher education, but also K through 12 educators. So college and K through 12 educators coming together. Um, activities are for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, unfortunately, at this point, they're designed, they're, they're available for a lot of the uh, physical sciences and biological sciences in STEM. There's actually now some social sciences with economics and, and political science starting to emerge. There's actually a lot of work in environmental science work, mathematics as well. And there's also some language activities that have come up for, I believe, Spanish specifically that are coming up. So that's sort of a little bit of the overview of where we are. So this is a group of people, thousands of us that come together and are interested in doing this. So you, what you did right now, what we did together in this very short period of time is the what is called the one hour mini Pogol experience. But um, as a, a faculty fellow here, I'm interested in potentially seeing what the interest is of the community on potentially hosting a, a longer workshop, something that is a little bit more substantial where we discuss the fundamentals of facilitation, for example. I find that workshop to be super useful in terms of thinking, how do you implement this in your classroom? So I'll probably be sending out a survey for the attendees and the people that also sign up for the workshop to sort of ask and see if there's interest for us to actually continue and doing something a little bit more substantial. So this will take, it will be several hours sort of of training where you actually get the in-depth but in the meantime, if you want to do this on your own, there's actually a lot of different resources in the Pogol project page. So it's pogol.org, where you can find podcasts from practitioners, a lot of the different resources that are available to you. There's actually a lot of different e-workshops that happen um, throughout the year, as well as longer three-day summer workshops where you get to learn basically not just the fundamentals of facilitation, but also writing and starting to write activities. And for those of you that come from disciplines, non from the physical sciences or biological sciences, the Pogo project is always actively looking for people interested in writing activities because the content, of course, we're content experts, but having really good activities that follow this model is actually something necessary for the community out there and interesting. This becomes sort of a published project. So you actually go to the clearinghouse, it becomes a published activity. And, and I'm always putting a commercial out there for those of you that have that interest um, that would be a really good opportunity. So um, right now, I'm just going to open it up for general questions. We have about, I think we have, what do we have? Five minutes, is that right? I think we have five minutes. Is that right, Lindsay? I think 210. Yes, yeah. you have five. five. Okay, so we have five minutes. So I'm just going to open it broadly for questions that you might have. And thank you again. This is a super short time. Hopefully it was, it was interesting and, and fun. So let's open it up. Luis. Santiago, may I jump in? Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Luis. I didn't see your hand, sorry. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I, I, I wrote my question in the Excel sheet, but basically I'm intrigued about your take on feedback. So when, when do you think the instructor should jump in? Because you've been hovering around the different breakout rooms, right? But you were just supervising, which is usually what I tell my students when I you know, divide, in, divide them in groups. So when do you think the instructor should give feedback? Is it during the presentation phase? Is it during the teamwork phase? Both. Uh, what's your take on that? And then also from the student's perspective, is there a particular role that is in charge of asking questions or could either the manager and the reflector and the presenter ask questions? Thank you, great, awesome questions. I'll start with your second questions. The point of the presenter is to give and empower a student within the team to represent their team. And the beauty of that is that oftentimes when we call on students, right, it's difficult or sometimes one student is very vocal. But if you give the presenter the power to say, you're not you're not answering for yourself. I always say, presenter, what was the answer from your team? I always make sure that I emphasize that the answer is coming from the team, not from them, so that they don't feel responsible for a bad answer or whatever. So yeah, mm -hmm. often I use, well, I always will use that sort of role specifically. And the same thing when I'm walking around. If I'm walking around, I don't let every, the, the vocal person or the manager just say, hey, I have a question. It's like, okay, presenter, what's the question from your team? So hopefully emphasizing that the questions funnel through the presenter as mm -hmm. things are challenging. And mm -hmm. to your first question in terms of intervening, so my role as a facilitator, and Sherry was mentioning this, I, I, I was trying to do a little bit of that, is to sometimes do reinforcing positive. So 
if I notice that they're making a good progress or if that question went well, I just kind of give them thumbs up or a quick like that looks good so that they kind of feel like they're moving along. Mm -hmm. But I often will have specific questions that I know based on experience that they're going to get kind of stuck on. And if I notice that that's starting to happen a lot, I then bring out the team and I say, okay, let's take a quick break. Let's correct or address this question that is being very common for everybody. And that's where I do some of that. Mm -hmm. And then on the report out mode is when I actually intervene a little bit more. If I notice some confusion or conflict, we talk about that and then I kind of clean it up as we go along. Gotcha. Thank yeah, you so, so much. That's, that's the dynamic for that. And and some of that will be for, addressed in the facilitator workshop, for example, if we do something like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much, Santiago. Thank, again. You. Thank you for your question. Uh, let's see if I can, I'm going to, I'm going to try to open the, uh, the parking lot, see what was, what else was there. It was only Luis, so I'll open up for other people. Thank you, Brian. No, thank you. What other questions do we have? I have one. We we talked in our room about, um, you know, even though official Pogel activities are only in the sciences and a little bit social sciences and math, um, that this general concept could apply to a lot of different disciplines. And I don't know if you have any recommendations of places people could go who are not in these disciplines, but to get a similar inquiry-based approach and guidance there. Yeah, so uh, Hannah, generally speaking, the beauty of it is that the facilitation skills, the structure of roles, um, the foundations of the things that we do are are all universal, right? So those are definitely applicable to all classes. The the challenging for some of the disciplines, challenge for some of the disciplines is that we don't have the activities quite available yet. So building on those activities, and and for example, if you have some interest in on the interest on that, what I can do is put you in contact. There are practitioners nationwide that are already doing things outside of the biological and physical sciences. So there's already a community of people building this. They're just potentially not yet approved for official POGO thing but there might be collections of activities already available for your individual discipline. It's possible that that is the case. And because they have a database of people and their disciplines, I can con put you in contact with them and find that. And if you're interested in learning how to write that, the writing workshops that are available for Pogo are not discipline specific. They're basically meant to be like, help you write a model and then write an effective learning cycle, et cetera. So those are also useful from that perspective. So it's taught from that context usually, like it's not necessarily trying to be all STEM focused or hard sciences focused. Yeah. But let me know, please, if you have any interest, I, I can put you in touch with somebody and then and then we'll connect you. I... But I think that it, yeah, go ahead, Luisa, last question, because I want to respond. Oh yeah, you. I have a really quick uh, last question. And, and first of all, thank you very much. I learned a Thanks. lot. Thanks in, for being here, in, Luisa. In this short period. Um, what what's your advice or how you uh, you think we should proceed if uh, students are not really complying with the roles and it becomes a mess? Like yeah, the, that's a that's a really good not. point. My classroom right now in general chemistry is starting to devolve into I want to ignore you from the roles, right? So it's starting to happen. It happens late in the semester. Uh, it happens early in the semester, but I'm very, very adamant and proactive about the roles on the first few weeks of the semester where I uh, describe reports, the reports where the students give feedback about the roles and how the team went is something that we share as a class and we talk about their scribe reports. I encourage them to read each other's reports. So I'm constantly hammering on the roles. It's like, come on, roles, roles, roles. And I'm always like, I'm trying to be funny, but I'm like, ignore, I really am ignoring the, anybody else. I was like, well, where's my reporter? Why is my reporter not telling me? So I'm, I'm waiting for the reporter to come to me, right? Or like always emphasizing managers, please raise your hand so that I know that you're done. And I'm trying to use that, like the language is, has to be very intentional. It has to happen like very cost, very frequently. Now I agree that I think that the students are kind of like eventually like, oh, whatever, out the window. And, and that that's just a lot more managing. So I just part of I don't have any specific secrets because it always devolves into I'm tired of it, but some of the teams are really good. And what I do sometimes too is that once I have very functional teams, after a few weeks, I actually change the teams around and I try to seed some of the functional people into the other spaces 
And that sometimes creates an atmosphere where they teach the others how to practice better pogo. So that can work oftentimes really well. So um, trying not to break up too much, but finding seeds of students that are bought in because some students are really, they really get excited about it and they can help other people move that direction. But I'm, I'm happy to hang around for a few more minutes after everybody goes, but I know I want to respect everybody's times and, and appreciate the fact that you were here. I'll be sending a little bit of an email to kind of see if there's any interest on in following up and kind of have a little bit more meaty discussion about this. Um, and anyway, you'll hear from me later on, but I'll hang it out for hang out for a few more minutes if you if you have any questions. Thank you, everybody. That was great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luisa. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. It was yeah. great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Hey. It was a it was a whirlwind. I'm sure you were. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The recording's still going. And no worries. <laughs> hold on. Uh, no. Uh, oh well. Great work. Great work. Ah. Uh, oh, I wanted you to stop the recording. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. There he goes. I can 